to today's National Soil Survey Center webinar. My name is Sean McVeigh, National Training Coordinator for the Soil Science Division and host for today's webinar, Geoportal Review of Seep Soil Vulnerability Index for Cultivated Cropland. This webinar is being recorded and all participants join the webinar in listen-only mode. You receive the webinar audio through your device's speakers. There is no telephone dial-in. If you are having audio difficulties, please check the various ways your computer speakers may be muted or have their volume set low, including the speaker adjustments available in the Adobe Connect interface. You can maximize your webinar experience in Adobe Connect by shutting down VPN and any other programs that might compete for bandwidth. This includes email and Microsoft Outlook and instant messaging and Skype. Taking a look at our webinar room layout, Adobe Connect has content pods that include the feature presentation, chat, and Q&A pods. Use the 4-hour icon in the Featured Presentation pod to enter and exit the full screen view as you choose. To submit a comment or question for me or our presenters, use the Q&A pod and type in your question. I'll handle technical difficulties the best I can while hosting the webinar and interact with our presenters to answer your questions during verbal Q&A periods. I want to thank Dan Malarkey for being here to support our webinar and introduce our panel of presenters for this webinar. Dan, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenters. Okay, thank you. There you go. I just want to tell you got 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, hi, folks. I'm Dan Malarkey, Director of the Resource Assessment Division. I want to thank you all for joining us today to talk about the Soil Vulnerability Index data layer. Lee Norfley, Sharon Waltman, and a few other folks will go into more background and detail. But the short story is that for our seed cropland conservation modeling work, we needed to assess inherent soil vulnerability to runoff and leaching. We've since been using the resultant SVI layer for soil interpretation in other applications. For example, Kevin Ingram used the SVI to help identify priority watershed in the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Initiative. Um, now we want to make the SVI layer available throughout NRCS for use in landscape planning activities and things like the state resource assessment. But first, we want to give states a chance to review it with the goal of assessing whether the SVI overall for cropland in your state is a good representative, a good representation of inherent vulnerability to runoff and leaching on cropland. We're interested in how well it works across different regions and landscapes in your state, again, uh, for cropland only, cultivated cropland. Before I turn it over to Sharon, I want to say thank you to Lee Norfleet, who got the criteria in place for this interpretation and is the technical lead on the Soil Vulnerability Index, to Kevin Ingram, who's been the master architect and really the driving force behind making this seed product and related products useful for a wide range of purposes and audiences in NRCS, to Sharon Waltman for putting together a great user guide for the SVI in this webinar, to Maxine Levin for, provi for providing guidance throughout and helping set up some small watershed tests of the SVI, and again, a big thanks to all of you who will now help us review the SVI for your states. We appreciate the time and thought you will put into it. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll turn it over to Sharon Waltman now. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I noticed I heard some background uh, noise. I thought maybe if we could ask folks to, to mute their, their phones when they're not speaking, that would be helpful too. All right, well, we just want to give you a little bit of an introduction right now to uh, the peer review process. And as some of you may know already or will know soon, uh, there was a letter that's gone out to all of the states from the uh, regional cons and the uh, deputy chiefs. Uh, I think it was went out yesterday, and attached to it is a uh, soil vulnerability index for a cultivated cropland user guide, as well as a set of hard copy survey questions that we would like uh, all the states and centers, whoever's on the list, to participate with. Uh, the leaders for each state, the state cons, are being asked to submit uh, technical uh, reviewers' names. And there will be a login they can go to to enter their names and say they've been approved by the SACON or their leaders. And what this is set up for is um, we've got a 45-day review period between June 25th and August 10th that you can do this review using the online web soil, um, 
excuse me, uh, web application, as well as any on-site information you want to gather. And then once that assessment's done, uh, we'd like you to complete a list of online uh, survey questions. And let's see here. Um, those are due by the, the August 10th deadline. And the responses from those survey questions are going to be used to help refine, further refine the SBI index for different parts of the, the country, is my understanding. So today we just hope to provide you a little bit of the background definitions and instruction and let you learn about how to get to the uh, GeoPortal uh, web application and begin to use it. Okay. Uh, one little oversight in the letter that went out, unfortunately, the hot link or the URL for this online entry of your name uh, is all left out of the scanned version. So we'll need to get this little URL to everyone so they can go ahead. Once you're chosen by your SACON, enter your name and information and click here that you've been to, uh, approved to participate. And then I'd like you to take a look at the um, user guide. It's, this is just a little snapshot of the index. And you'll see there's a lot more detail than we'll go into today here and encourage you to take a look at it. And if you look under uh, Appendix C, this is where you're going to find another copy of those peer review questions. And then, um, unfortunately, Appendix C and D were left off of this version that was emailed, but we will make uh, the full uh, data or user guide available to you here shortly, too. Probably just send out another email. All right. Uh, the peer review itself has four sections. Uh, there's one dedicated to the cultivated cropland map layer. So I'll ask you a few questions about that. Uh, there's one related to the runoff portion of the SBI for cultivated cropland one related to leaching, and then one related to a managed version of leaching, just pretty much uh, whether or not you've been using uh, potential for uh, ag drainage for the leaching modification there. So what we do recommend is you read through all of the hard copy questions before starting the review. You get a handle for the kinds of questions we'll be asking. Mostly we're asking to find out, is this doing a good job in ranking the soils for these various um, vulnerabilities? Um, when you do answer the online uh, questions, it is a survey monkey uh, uh, questionnaire. And there are, we ask that the seek researchers recommended that you stand them between, as a minimum, of 7 to 11 site locations. Now, these could be physically on site if you happen to be in the field and want to do that, or virtually using the GeoPortal web application. The web application has a bookmark widget that allows you to record these sites, too, to keep track of them. Uh, in total, there's 35 questions. It takes about 25 minutes to complete. And the URL to locate the online survey is given in Appendix B of the user's guide. All right, and now I think I'm going to hand this over to Lee Norfleet, who's the um, originator of all of these rule sets, and let Lee go ahead. If you just want to tell me when you want the next slide, I'll go ahead and give it to you. And if you're on mute, you yep. might want to take yourself off mute. <laughs> yeah, the most brilliant thing I've been going to say all day was just missed. <laughs> okay, uh, to start off with some of the background is, is exactly why did we even try this? Because as many of you know, we, there's already several dozens of interps within the, within the SOILS program and in, in our databases. Um, but this was a, an effort because we had to simplify things in order to make sense of a lot of our seep conservation modeling and, and uh, how different conservation practices interact with uh, the, the soil types and the cropping systems. And, but the biggest issue that we found when we got into our uh, corporate data is that, and then we all know this as well, those of us are on soil scientists on the call, is that a lot of the interps are uh, in there from a, a, a kind of a time frame a, a, across time. And then there's some different political boundaries and different thoughts that went in. So there were some inconsistencies in the system uh, that we couldn't afford to have on a national scale. Uh, so that's one of the ac actions that we needed to do. And after we started using it, we saw its applicability to, uh, to planners maybe, especially some of the young planners and then people that may move from one location to the other. You know, when we have thousands and thousands of soil series, the ability to 
understand their behavior uh, would take a lot of time and effort and experience. So to speed that process up and to group soils that would behave similar to similar sets of conservation and cropping practices, uh, we put those in the you know wanted to put those in these groups, and so that kind of helps speed things up. And you know, as you know, for us, a lot of times we'll split soils out because of something that might happen at a meter and a half or two meters deep, and it may not make that big of a difference when it comes to uh, conservation practices needed or or cropping systems. So another thing about analysis uh, that we that we have learned to understand also is that. When you're presenting material, if you need usually at least three categories, but once you exceed five categories, it's it's really hard to to really figure out what you have. So that's why we kind of have a low, moderate, moderately high, and high is to hit a happy medium in between there. So now I'm ready for the next one. Okay, very similar to the old land capability classes system. This you know this is a, a locally relevant comparison. You know, you can't look at a high runoff or a high leaching soil in, in one part of the country and immediately uh, say that it's higher than another. Or a high runoff soil in Arizona is not comparable to the amount of runoff you're going to get in southeast Georgia. They're just not. But what it is is that when there are rain events, uh, those are the ones where you should expect to have the, the, the greatest amount of runoff and, and then problems from that runoff. So there, it's a locally relevant um, system. And the way we came about this was to look at how soils behave when we removed all the conservation that we saw in our model simulations. So we calibrate the model to known research, so we're getting in the ballpark of what should happen, uh, the same type of research that went into verifying and calibrating things like Russell 2 and WEP and WEPs and those, those type studies, as well as several others for, that go with nutrients. So we take the practices away and look at what the, the, the native or inherent state uh, would be if you farm that soil without any conservation whatsoever. So the only thing we kept was the crop rotation. Okay, next one. So what we did after that was uh, try to select what region did we want to base our runoff on. And so we you know, selected the one that would probably have the most runoff with the most intense rainfall. And uh, we looked at the group of, of uh, with our, our data output that we had, it looked like grouping uh, those in the greater than 250 R factor range, which is pretty, you know, 35 or 40 inch uh, precip zone and greater. Uh, some of that zone may have a little less than that, but it's that area, uh, like central Texas, it has some uh, highly convective storms. So, you know, you may get uh, a quarter to a half of your annual rainfall in an afternoon. So they're, they're, they needed high, the highest level of, uh, runoff protection. Uh, in doing that, we considered uh, our threshold we use in SEEP, that if you have a successful conservation system looking at runoff and sediment loss, it loses less than two tons per acre per year. So if, uh, if a soil did that without any conservation, we called it low. And we just arbitrarily said if you're four times that much, we'll call it high, and then we split the difference for the other ones. Uh, leaching was a little different because we, uh, we needed to uh, use a constituent for that. So we went in that one, we went to the region of the country that had the highest uh, use of nitrogen fertilizers and manures. And that was pretty much the upper Midwest, which fell in the 150 to 250 category largely. And we used that one. Uh, again, our uh, threshold that was developed uh, with uh, the SAR-17 researcher group uh, felt like that um, the threshold there is 25 pounds or less of leaching losses would could be considered uh, an acceptable loss. And of course, that can be debated all day long, but that's what we used. And we did a similar uh, type approach in, in making the next categories, but instead of doing a 4x type approach, we, we went in increments of 50 pounds. Uh, and then we used our data to help us with that. So next slide. So after we had all these model runs, uh, we uh, worked with some statisticians and had some statistical software packages to find out which, which properties made the most difference for runoff and leaching. And uh, probably no surprise, it turned out to be hydrologic group 
Uh, K-factor was, was pretty uh, sensitive, obviously, to uh, erodibility, but it was also pretty good at predicting infiltration rates that were pretty high, and which usually led to uh, higher leaching rates. And then, uh, the, you know, slope, obviously, that's going to be one that's going to dictate both of them to a large extent. And they, they came out by far the, the three most key factors in determining the leaching uh, vulnerability or leaching risk that a soil presents and, and the runoff risk. So within each hydrologic group, uh, we again used a uh, statistical technique called recursive partitioning, and it just keeps splitting the populations uh, in, the, in the machinery in the background until the, 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 the splits are, are evident as to splitting from low, moderate, moderately high. And, and with the classification that we had with our model output, that allowed us to find out at what um, K factors and slope breaks within a hydrologic group uh, would determine whether a soil was a, a, a low, moderate, moderately high, or high risk for runoff or leaching. Uh, and I, you see the SVI user guide will show you where those splits landed in there. Uh, and I think that is that is it, isn't it, Sharon? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it from here then, if that's okay. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's just cover quickly. We wrote a, a short definition for the soil vulnerability index on cultivated crop land. <clears throat> and you'll find this in the user guide as well. Um, the SEEP researchers uh, chose the term soil vulnerability and uh, helps to describe, I guess uh, this may not be a perfect definition, but the capacity of the soil resource to withstand the potential impacts of cultivation in the landscape by uh, either allowing or not allowing losses of sediment and excess nutrients from the farmer's field and into surface and groundwaters. Uh, it's recognized that such losses can reduce the water quality in the agroecosystem and diminish uh, soil productivity. Uh, so the SEED project looks at these impacts at multiple scales, from the field to watershed and up to river basins and lake basins. The SVI is considered um, a modified soil interpretation uh, compared to the conventional kinds you might see in web soil survey in that it is restricted just to the cultivated cropland portion of that landscape, of the soil landscape. And um, based on the background that Lee has just given you, I'd like to now cover some of the um, rule sets for runoff, leaching, and then leaching in a managed condition um, for the, um, that we used to apply to the soil um, g sergo and sergo components. As Lee mentioned, they, he was able to tease out about six um, parameters that are become really his predictors for behavior for vulnerability. And these are include hydrologic soil group, the soil K factor, slope, rock fragment content in the soil surface, uh, and taxonomic classification. We just kind of split organic versus mineral soils, as well as the soil drainage class. And um, let's see, not all of, well, we'll talk about the six total parameters. Runoff uh, will uh, considers four parameters. In this table for the uh, runoff rule set, you'll see the first three columns are dealing with the hydrologic soil group, percent slope, and K-factor. And the, the last three columns on the right-hand side are different uh, categories of rock fragment volumes in the soil surface. Um, the colors are denoting the low um, resulting vulnerability classification in dark green, moderate in uh, a light green, and moderately high in orange, and then the high in the red color at the bottom. So you can see here that progressively from the bottom left-hand corner of the uh, table to the right-hand upper right-hand corner, you go from high vulnerabilities to low, depending on how we have the um, hydrologic soil group um, ranked here against slope and K-factor and cultivated cropland. I'm sorry, and the rock fragment volume. The, uh, the few fragments, some fragments, many fragments are just broken down as less than 15 percent. So few, some means between 15 and 35, and many is greater than or equal to 35. These are the, um, each one of the colors here kind of sets the bounding box for those classes uh, within the uh, runoff vulnerability. 
Uh, next, we have the leaching rule set, and now we've added one more parameter, and that is the soil classification. This is where we split between a, a mineral and uh, organic soils. And it's pretty much the same uh, organization of the table. Uh, the rock fragment breakdown here for the surface is a little different. Few here is a 10, and some means 10 to 30, and many means greater than 30%. Uh, just to note at the bottom here, if you look at only the last record in the table is yes for histosol, so that if it has a histosol classification or histic epipedon, there it is always classified as in a high vulnerability rating for leaching. All right. And then the final one is we take the uh, leaching vulnerability class and further subdivide it or class it into a lineage ma uh, leaching managed um, classification. What we do is look at those components that meet the requirement for relatively level and poorly drained or wet soils uh, and then class it further. Uh, in this case, relatively level is anything that's less than or equal to 3% slope. And poor drainage classes are considered very poorly, poorly, and somewhat poorly drained. If we have the, on the left-hand column, we have the leaching vulnerability classes, you'll see that only the low class can actually get to a moderately high rating. All other classes would go into a high rating for the managed condition or the presence of ag, ag land drainage in these soils. Uh, next, I'd just like to review uh, the, the desktop, uh, ArcGIS desktop um, soil vulnerability index for cultivated cropland tool. And to acknowledge Steve Teasley, he, Steve is the one who took the rule set and that Lee has mapped out and worked with him to compile this little um, desktop tool that mostly just the resource assessment division staff, uh, Peter and Tony, run to develop these kind of enterprise level data sets. So we'll just go through how that works, <clears throat> and then we will enter into a, an online demonstration of the GeoPortal uh, web application. Uh, there's basically about six GIS processing steps that we follow. Um, you can, these are taken right from the user guides. You can read in more greater detail at your leisure. Uh, we used a toolbox um, that was written, I think it was about a year ago. And it's done on the RTIS desktop, and we use the gridded Sergo and Sergo file geodatabases. And the application that you'll be viewing in the portal uh, is actually based on a 2015 fiscal year data set that was produced. Uh, we create four tables, the horizons, components, dominant condition, or the majority condition, and then a pie table. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so these tools uh, utilize the rule sets we've just uh, reviewed. Uh, let's see. We went ahead and um, ran that so the attributes are sitting there. And then we um, mask the contaminous US uh, gridded Sergo 30 meters um, using a custom cultivated cropland mask. And you'll, review, you'll see that in the application here, too. And we will be asking you questions on the survey about that particular map layer. Uh, once it's done, then we go ahead and do the mapping of the dominant condition for the vote for three, app, three themes, the runoff, leaching, and leaching managed. Um, the component and pie table um, tables are actually used to support the narrative and pie charting you'll see in the web application. And we use adopt a standard legend um, uh, set of colors. And right now, I will apologize to that percentage of the audience who happens to be red, green, colorblind, but these are the colors that we <laughs> traditionally use. Um, there are also numbers to follow along here, too. So you'll see the same colors repeated on the maps and the pie charts and anywhere else that we're referring to these different classifications. Um, the supporting base map layers and other reference map layers um, were provided by RAD and NCGE and supported and stood up these map um, services that you'll see. I think these are coming out of Kansas City. And we are very grateful for the support and guidance they provided us in getting that done. 
a little snapshot here at the bottom that just shows you what that little file geodatabase looks like when it gets done. There's the components, dominant condition, horizons, and pie table. So how does that get done? We begin, as I mentioned earlier, that each um, soil component that has adequate data is uh, classified. And we begin by extracting map unit level information, and there's a list of the attributes used. Component level information, again, another list here given. Um, the horizon level, too, as is appropriate, mostly just surface horizon information. So these all go into some intermediate tables, temporary tables. But using those, then we follow the uh, bounds of the rule sets as set out by Lee. And we did work back and forth with Lee to help refine these as needed. Um, we actually classify each and every soil map component. Um, and then we map for just those that are occurred within the cultivated cropland mask that the, um, that the RAD folks have prepared. Um, to do the mapping, we actually sum the component percentages, and those are used to determine the majority conditions and that's often mapped on the map layer itself. Below in this little table, you'll see we've chosen a, an HAC or Hagerstown silt loam 8 to 15 percent slope mass unit. And there are three, four components here. Each of them has a component percentage rating. Uh, Hagerstown is 85% of the mass unit. Carbo is 8%. Opekin is 5%. And Clarksburg, 2%. And then the last three columns, you see each and every one of them, if there is sufficient information, will be given a, an assignment of a rating. Three is moderate, technically high. One would be low. Two is moderate, and so on. So the integers are, are coded. In this case, because the Hagerstown uh, component uh, is pretty much a majority of the map unit, this will usually carry as the dominant condition, whatever the classification for that component is. However, in some cases, if you have um, a split uh, high diversity map unit, you can have the sum of a couple lesser percentage components actually uh, take sway over the, uh, the largest component percentage. So the final map uh, summary table is created by summarizing these intermediate component level tables. And so you see an example here where what's going to be appear in the map will be the Hagerstown silt loam with the 85% as the representative. Um, leaching will come out as moderately high. Runoff is going to be high. And leaching managed is going to be moderately high. Uh, the descriptions are added when we go to the mapping. And then the final SDI rating tables are joined to the raster. And it's actually the raster you'll see when um, Peter shows you the conterminous US map layers. And when we zoom in, we'll go switch over to a vector that has all of the attributes for each and every component of those cultivated cropland soils. Uh, I just want to run through a, a sample calculation here. And we're going to continue to use that HAC map unit. And it happens to be that this is also one uh, soil that um, is a residual limestone soil in the Northeast, in particular the Chesapeake. It's uh, one of the more prominent agricultural soils. Um, you'll take a look here. You'll see that they are in pretty much the limestone valleys in the region valley. And the map unit that we've just taken a look at here, this little uh, map layer, is called um, it's called a carbonate, carbonate karst heat map for, and the outlines you'll see here are actually individual 12-digit hucks. We've computed something called a heat map, which is the proportion of the area within a huck that is actually mapped with some kind of calcium or a carbonate karst limestone uh, present. So we use that sort of as a filtering uh, layer to let you know when you're in a huck that has this karst condition. So this is where we are down on the ground for this Hagerstown soils, and I think in this case Steve chose an example in Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, and this, um, we've kind of selected this map unit because it is interesting to look at, plus it also represents uh, a map unit in the karst landscape. Down at the bottom here you'll see a little block diagram courtesy of the Kentucky. Geological Survey and University of Kentucky. Uh, they map out nicely here the kinds of issues that you can encounter 
when you have residual limestone soils. They actually landscapes have a lot of um, sinkholes, um, dissolutions, um, uh, collapse features, sinking streams, um, and those kinds of things, which are really pretty much there, um, represent a high risk uh, because there are many more direct pathways between the surface and underground aquifers due to this high porosity and crevices in the underlying bedrock. Uh, and also, just to remind everyone, the karst aquifers supply drinking water to about a quarter of the global population. So there are really many people rely on them, and they are quite vulnerable. So let's just take a look here at what the soil vulnerability looks like uh, based on our uh, index for this particular map unit. Uh, for the Hagerstown, which is the majority here, uh, we've got uh, runoff is high and leaching and leaching variants are both moderately high. For the carbo, it's 8%. It's uh, also high because this is a highly sloping map unit that's taking precedence. And leaching and managed leaching are low. The opecan, which is the shallow residual soil, is again, runoff is high. Leaching and leaching managed are both moderate. And then the Clarksburg, which is more of a local alluvium colluvium, Soil in this landscape are high and moderate, moderate. So what will this look like? When we go through the mapping uh, to get to that level, you can see here for the upper portion of the table is devoted to the runoff rating. So all four of those components rate high. So 100% of the map unit is giving a high rating. The middle table shows the leaching rating. And again, Hagerstown is 85% and low is 8 and about 7% is in the moderate category. So still, the Hagerstown would be the majority for mapping. For the component percent, um, for the leaching managed, we have a very similar classification with again 85% going into the majority condition. However, for, so that's the conventional way that we would probably show this. Uh, say a web field survey or other thematic maps. But on the GeoPortal um, web application, we're able to retain all of the information. So when you interrogate the map unit of your choice, you will be given uh, the first little pie chart here shows you that 100% for runoff is in the high category. The middle pie chart will show you the leaching um, rating, and it shows both the contrasting 8 and 7% for um, let's see, that is the low and the moderate categories, as well as in the leaching managed, the very similar classification there. All right, so now I think we're ready to dive into the web application. I'd like to hand this over to Peter and Tony, if they're ready. Hi, this is uh, Peter Chen and Tony O'Shilling. We're going to be demonstrating the SDI web application. Um, here, my screen. And quickly demonstrate how the user would go to Jill Portal and sign in initially. So you will use your e-authentication profile and try to log into Geo Portal initially. It will prompt you for your passcode. And once you're signed in, what you want to do is is um, access your your group tab. <coughs> And you will see that you're, you have been invited to deep SDI revealing workspace. Once you're in, you want to sort by web application. And you'll see an icon for, for the SDI web application. Once you initialize the web application, it's somewhat intuitive. Um, you'll see the layer list, um, and you'll see the three major featured operational layers, the SBI runoff, the SBI leaching, the SBI leaching managed, and you can expand to see the actual legend showing the ranking of each conservation concern from high to low. 
You can turn it off and turn it on. You also have the capability to set the transparency of each layer. And by any chance you accidentally close this interface, you can always access it on the top. And all your navigational um, widgets are on, on your left-hand corner of the, of, the, of the web application. You got your zoom, you got your zoom out, you got your full extent, layer list widget. You have an option to select different types of base maps, make, the shaded release, Coco. <laughs> We got a comment in the chat. Could you speak up just a little bit louder, please? Sorry. You have the capability to set a bookmark for a particular site. You can add that for you to later on want to revisit that particular site. Let me demonstrate here. Site one, you can go back at a later date. And lastly, you have the swiping tool. When you have multiple layers turned on, you want to compare the actual layers. For example, here you want to compare the, the runoff layer versus the legion. And now I hand off the web, web applications to Tony to demonstrate the actual SBI pie chart widget. OK, great. So this uh, on the right here, is the uh, SBI pie chart widget. Um, you can see here I just clicked and it generated uh, the, the pie chart over here on the, the right hand side. Um, it'll give you the breakdown of, of the soil vulnerability class by area percent. Um, this soil is 100 percent high for runoff. Um, every time you click on a soil it generates three, three uh, pie chart uh, reports, uh, and to see uh, the different ones, you can zo uh, zoom down here, um, and you can see the top one is always going to be runoff, the second one will be leaching, and the third one will always be leaching managed. Um, and below, below the, uh, the map unit, symbol and the uh, soil vulnerability class by area. We have the component info and the breakdown by components and um, soil properties that go into the calculation of the SBI. Um, if by any chance this widget is closed, uh, no cl clicking will, uh, will generate any soil uh, SBI pie charts. So we'll have to click the, uh, the widget on the top right to reopen that, and you will be free to uh, click on another map unit uh, to check out the soil breakdown, SVI breakdown. Um, to want to, if you ever want to clear a selection, you can click up into the search box and then just press the delete key on your keyboard uh, to start fresh. Um, and that's about it for the usability of the web application. I'll send it back to Sharon. Okay. Um, I was going to say, um, could you show the uh, group, uh, yeah, keep on showing them the, uh, let's see, the MLRA and the heat map while you're up there, uh, Tony or Peter? Sure, no problem. Yes, we also have uh, two reference layers, uh, the, the carbonate karst heat map. Uh, Maybe zoom in so they can see the percent. And yeah. give them the legend too. There's um, there's more detail about how this is calculated in the user's guide too. So. And then I can zoom out a bit. Uh, for reference, we have the uh, MLRA <coughs> uh, reference layer as well. Yeah, thank you very much. That's great. Cool. All right. All right, anything else?
We'll go back to the slide. Yep, that's we're all set. All righty. Uh, I think I have just maybe one more slide in here that's showing kind of where to get started. I don't know how many in our uh, audience have used the uh, Geo Portal, but there will be instructions given in the user guide how exactly how to get started. And once you you submit your names, um, I think they go will go to Peter. I think that's right, right? Uh, you will be invited to go into the uh, FCICC group on the Geo Portal, and then you'll have access. Uh, let's see here. And now just to give a brief summary, uh, we just wanted to um, review that this letter has gone out. I think it was dated yesterday. And it includes an attachment to the user guide and the hard copy survey questions. Uh, we asked the SACONs or other uh, directors to submit technical reviewers. And I think we'll, we'll need to get that URL out to the group so that they can submit their names online so they can get logins to the GeoPortal application. Uh, the review period starts Monday, the 25th, and goes through the 10th of August. Um, you're, you are complete once you finish your online survey question. And I think there's something in the letter to the effect of asking the state cons or the directors to verify that those are completed by each one of the designated reviewers. Or maybe they can do a composite review, too. I'm not sure exactly how it's written right now. Um, again, those survey responses will be used to refine the index rules. Um, and um, let's see. I guess that's about it. We're here just to give you the introduction to that, and now we can go to any questions and answers. Uh, just sure. just to to mention sure. that rules that should go to uh, questions go to Kevin Ingram and Lee Northwick, and anything related to the web application to Peter, which is really Chen Chen, uh, and Robert Osterling, which is also known as Tony, and Steve Peasley. So with that, I'll turn it over. All right, Sharon, so I'll just remind people to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A pod, uh, and we'll pick those up. But there have been some uh, comments and questions in the chat that we can get started on. So several people have asked about the user's guide. And Sharon, I believe you said that would be distributed by email. Can you speak to that briefly? Uh, yes, it was attached to the um, it was a memo or letter that came out from um, the deputy chief for SSRA and the regional cons. Um, and maybe Dan can answer that, too. It should have gone to, I think, directly to the state con. Is that correct, Dan? Yes, Sharon, that's here? correct. Uh, a letter went out late yesterday from the RCs and the acting director of SSRA to all the state cons and directors. Uh, that letter had the user guide uh, and a hard copy of the, the uh, review questions attached. And actually, in the body of the email, um, the 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 link to sign up for uh, for access is live uh, in oh, the body great. of the email in the scanned copy of the letter that was also attached. Um, it's not live, you know. That's just a scanned copy. But cool. if the state conservationists could just forward that message to each of their reviewers, they should have everything that they need. Um, except, I guess, those two uh, uh, appendixes that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and we will provide the details in those, too. I think they just got overlooked. Um, uh, is there a way that we can share that um, user guide also uh, today, Sean, you're suggesting, or not? Uh, yeah, somebody wants to upload that into a file share pod here. I'll call that up on the slide. And one of you that is uh, hosting today can uh, simply upload that document, and I will move it over, and people can download it from this handouts pod. Uh, so what do I do? Just click on on pods to do that, or no? Nope, there's a little triangle there to choice list, oh, okay. and then it says upload file. Okay, hold on, I can do that. There's okay. another uh, question in the chat is from Manuel. It says Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands are not included in the drop down as a sole vulnerability index technical review team form. Is, is, uh, is there anything available for outside the contaminous US? 
That's a good question. Uh, Lee, do we have that or not? We don't have that completed. Uh, of course, since this does run off of the soils data for those locations, they could easily be run uh, and, and develop that. And I thought we might have been already starting that process for at least Puerto Rico. There's a question in the Q&A from Steve. It says, do the SBI leaching ratings account for increased risk due to artificial irrigation? Uh, yes, we do have that in the in the larger one, but you would move your uh, risk level up with increased irrigation, uh, but it is somewhat in there. Okay, and Rick asks, will this PowerPoint be available? And yes, we are recording today's PowerPoint, and we'll make that available uh, after that's been reviewed and approved. Uh, there was some confusion about what's actually running this interpretation, whether that's in NASIS or not. And the SBI is not a NASIS-based interpretation. But why don't you use, clarify that for us? Oh, I guess I, I can do that one. This is Sharon. Um, this was written, uh, it's pretty much, if you compare it with NASIS-type interpreters, I would call it a CRISP classification. Uh, and it is written with rule sets in um, uh, 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 Python script uh, running on uh, desktop ArcGIS. And Steve Peasley did the writing of it. So the, the logic, I think, is probably very similar to some of the traditional um, NASA's uh, interps. I don't know if we've got, I suppose the best person to answer that question might be Bob Dobos. I think he might be on the line, but I don't know if we can get his mic mic in here or not. But uh, um, I think it, I believe because it was derived from the SEEP research and analysis, that's kind of the direction it came from. So it really didn't ever have a life in the NASA's um, interps generator. So this is Maxine Levin, um, National Leader for Soil Interpretation. And that's correct, is that um, all the work was done outside of NASA's where the data was imported and then worked on the outside because there was other data elements, or data, data elements that we wanted to use in the analysis from the SEEP, the SEEP work. So that's how it was done. It might be in the future that it could be a standard interp at some point uh, when we get our NASA's interps generator where we can work outside NASA's per se in the system. But uh, for right now, uh, it's using a data set, a specific data set of a download of NASA's. I think it was 2015 that most of the work was done on. and. Um, and, and that's one of the most important reasons why we'd like some feedback from the field, from the states, uh, to pinpoint if there are some glaring errors or, or misconceptions in, in the output. Thank you. I just let people know that uh, we've uploaded some handouts in the handouts pods, the user's guide, and a peer review questionnaire. You just click on the file name, click Download Files, and you can download those to your computer. Uh, Mike asks in the chat, why the difference in the rock fragment criteria? Uh, this is Sharon. I think that might be one for Lee. Yeah, I, I missed that. Excuse me. Uh, Mike asks in the chat, why the difference in the rock fragment criteria? Well, oh, those differences are from our soil survey manual and, and that information that breaks those down. And so that volume, the changing volumes of rock fragments would then change the different water holding capacities and therefore their runoff and leaching. They're consistent with our, some of our breaks we use in mapping. And there's a couple questions in here related to the soil drainage classes that are used. And let's see, it says, could they tell me what depths are being used for drainage classes? And if there's another follow-up comment. It appears that the, the query it moved on me. It appears the query uses the drainage classes populated, which means all bets are off when it comes to assigning depth. I don't know, Lee, can you speak to that, the depths that are used for the drainage classes? 
That is, it is. We use the assigned drainage class that the the soil map unit was given locally. So we don't use whatever localized depth criteria or changes that they are across the country. We use uh, the interpretations that have already been made locally. Okay. And those breaks, there was a uh, drainage water management task force uh, within the agency um, a couple of three years ago. And uh, the, 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 those drainage classes and that slope break were where uh, it was determined by that group to be the most common uh, uh, conditions in which uh, tile drainage was being used to improve production. And Lori has a question. This is a data slash SVI interpretation refreshed with new Sergo data sets annually, or is there a plan for refreshing the scores or adding new data when new soils are mapped, for instance? Hi, this is Sharon. I think I could take that one. I think that is the long-term goal, uh, is to be able to generate um, like a, re a refresh on the SBI classification each time that the data are published for the fiscal year. Um, I know that I believe in the in the user's guide too, Steve Peasley also has constructed like a, um, I think it's a soil data access facility query that could be used to at least pluck out a 12-digit um, a hook uh, from the published web services and so forth. I think that's a longer-term goal. I don't think that right now is the possibility. I suppose if you were to incorporate something like this into the NASA's and then publish it as a enter, as, as Maxine was suggesting, that might be the other solution to that. Uh, for this review, we kind of started with a 2015 data set. So don't judge the, the vintage of the data, just judge the rule sets if you can on this, this particular review. There's a question that's come up too about the, the karst data set. In, in the coastal plain, it's suspect in the mid-Atlantic coastal plain. Can the karst data set be edited? Oh, yeah. The, we did that calculation across the whole nation and it was based on um, a union between the 12-digit HUC and the USGS um, carbonate karst map layer. And we got some uh, areas where it exceeds 100%, so we flagged those. So I don't know if you can, we, if you have some input into what you think they ought to be, we could, we could um, revise it, I guess. For this purpose of this review, I don't think we can, but in the future we can. That was a draft data set we put together to help do some screening to make people aware of when, when they were or were not in a karst uh, hydrologic unit. So yeah, we're aware of that. And Manuel has a follow-up question. Do they know when the Caribbean area SPI will be available and ready for review, or what has to be done to make that available for review? Uh, Lee, do you think there would be modifications to the rule set for the Caribbean? Uh, you know, that's one we might want to work directly with Manuel on that. Uh, you know, right now I can say no because it's the, the standard, but there may be intricacies in those, especially those volcanic ones that may cause us to want to change some rule sets. But barring any, you know, modeling data that or other data that could uh, cause us to want to significantly change those breaks, and, and being that it's still going to be a relative relationship, uh, I think they, you know, we may be able to just uh, do it when, when uh, you know, the, the staff up there has time to, to pull in the data and, and apply the algorithms. Um, that, that was my thought is if, unless you wanted to change the rule set, maybe you want to run them once just to evaluate, that it would be simply just to run the tool on the appropriate data set for the Caribbean and the, um, for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Well, he, he took me on a route that I can tell him right now it's all high. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> so uh, Lee and, and Sharon and, and Manuel, um, certainly the soil staff, uh, Bob and, and Steve, will be available to work with them uh, on that and to work with you all. Um, we have been starting on, on similar efforts in Puerto Rico anyway, and um, it, we can work as an interface and, and try to apply that uh, at the the algorithms and the rule set um, to Puerto Rico in the next month.
if that's helpful. And another question has come in. Uh, Dwayne asks, after this review, will this data be available for public use? Mm, good question. I, I think it has to be, since it is you know publicly all public data and most all of our stuff without the 1619, I believe that's the right number, privacy attached to it, uh, at some point in time it, it's going to be public. I think uh, once the review period is closed out in August, we'll write a summary of it and make some recommendations. So go ahead and take the, take the survey for those of the, you that get tagged to be the technical reviewers. Um, you know, do your investigations and tell us exactly what you think about uh, how well this is working or not, and maybe make suggestions. But most of every one of these survey questions has a comment section in it, too, where you can add more comments. And a, a follow-up question to that, Dwayne's is from Wayne, is will it be released with the most current soil data? So I know we're looking at the uh, Web Sulfur annual refresh coming up here in the next couple months. I think he's speaking to that. I don't yes. believe there will be time for this year to be with the refresh for this year. So I think there's going to need to be a review. We had hoped to get this review done earlier in the year, so there, that, that might be that, but that potential. But at this point, I don't see that we'll be able to get it done in time to do it, that. It yeah, might we'll, be a little bit later after the after the refresh is published, because we have to work with published data at this point. So, yeah. Would, would so there, wouldn't there there wouldn't there be value and and after the comments come in and we uh, see if there are any changes suggested by the the folks reviewing it at that point would be seem like a logical time if we got to run some changes to start with to just do the whole thing. Yeah. We start certainly plan to do that. Um, I just think that the timing for the download as official data won't be quite there yet. Um, but we certainly will have the information in this, you know, um, I believe that we'll have it ready around January for sure for, for a wider distribution. And it might be that you'll have one more year of provisional looking at it and reviewing back and forth before there's an official download that, that might be available. That's the way I see it, but um, it might go faster. If, mm -hmm. if the review goes really well, it might be that there's not that much work to do and, and we can go ahead and, mm -hmm. and do a download with the new data. I think it might be really interesting at the end of once we compile all the inputs uh, from the surveys, maybe give another webinar and show what the results are. And that's exactly what Michael has in the chat is, can you have a follow-up presentation after oh. the survey and any edits perhaps before the release? Yeah, yeah. See how it goes, I guess. Uh, maybe Peter or Tony can say how long it takes to run this and, and re rebuild it. How, many, how much time, once you get published data, how much time do you think it would take? I take two, two to three weeks to, to refine the web application, make sure the, the web mapping services are running smoothly. Mm -hmm. So not not terrible amount of time. The actual web tool we run on a desktop only takes um, well, minutes to run the whole whole Coterminus US, and we actually run it on everything, but then we later mask it to drop off non-agricultural soil. So it doesn't take that long to run the um, classification. And Michael asks, is it anticipated to be available via conservation desktop in the future? Yes. All right. Well, folks, it looks like we've exhausted our questions. So I'm going to thank our panel for their time and effort to make this presentation, and thanks to all the participants for joining in. Uh, we had more than 90 people join today's webinar, and the on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our Soil Survey Center YouTube channel uh, once it's approved. So feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. Is there any closing comments from our panel? 
This is Dan Malarkey. Um, I would just like to reiterate my thanks. Uh, we are hoping to get some, some good feedback from the state, so I want, uh, <clears throat> just need to remind you all this is, this is only to be used for cultivated cropland um, and that uh, you know, we, we really are interested in this, um, in finding out how you feel about it overall. It's not, uh, you know, if, if there are individual, you know, sort of isolated cases of, of issues, um, we're, we're, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're interested in, in your overall impression, um, not every tiny little problem that you find with it, but if there's like a category where it's just not representative, that we need to know that. I'd also like to add that if you know, since we are just doing cropland right now, if if the group has thoughts or considerations of how they'd want to change things for other land uses, and and maybe begin the thoughts of developing it for other land uses, or is it worthwhile doing? All right. Well, thanks everyone, and this is going to conclude our webinar presentation.